Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. I'm here at the Mance to continue the series talking about the, the Cunningham Lectures, this, this wonderful collection of old theological works. It was founded, as I've said, in 1861 as a memorial to Principal William Cunningham, one of the greatest minds of his day. And it was established as a lectureship in New College, Edinburgh. It still exists. But when it was established, New College was the flagship theological seminary of the Free Church of Scotland. And the goal of the Cunningham Lectures was to set up a lectureship that meant that these students at New College would every few years have, in other words, everyone would get during their course at some point, they would hear lectures in greater depth on subjects that they did study and lectures on subjects that perhaps were not normally part of the curriculum. This was a free church lectureship and so most of the lectures were ministered to the Free Church of Scotland up until 1900 when the Free Church of Scotland, the majority, and the Cunningham lectures go with the majority, where the majority joined with the United Presbyterians and became the United Free Church of Scotland. And then, of course, down the line, 1929, the UF, the majority of the United Free Church and the Church of Scotland get together, and that's the modern Church of Scotland. And that's why the Cunningham Lectures are now part of the Church of Scotland. But the first Cunningham Lecturer who was not a Free Church of Scotland minister was John Cairns. There he is, it is the Excellent biography by A.R. McEwen, over, it's almost 800 pages, so there's a lot to say about the man, and obviously I'm not going to go into very much detail about his life, because if you did, well, it, this would be a very long video. But Principal Cairns came from the, the, the border area between England and Scotland. He was born on the 23rd of August, 1818, at Ayton Hill in Berwickshire. His father was a shepherd who worked on the estate of one of the local landowners. His father's name was also John. The family were part of the United Secession Church. This had been formed by a number of 18th century nonconformist groups in Scotland coming together in the 19th century to form a larger church. They, they all originated in the same secession in the same action where the, the Erskine brothers protesting against moderatism in the Church of Scotland, the Erskine brothers came out and began the Secession Church, which then split over a number of issues. But over the decades, they'd managed to get a lot of these splinters back together again, and that was why they were called the United Secession Church, because otherwise it sounds a rather strange title. You know, why would you, how can you be a united secession? Well, because there used to be a disunited secession. Well, as he grew up, John helped out on the farm, helped out as a shepherd himself, and he entered into that great company of shepherds of sheep who have gone on to become pastors of men. He entered Edinburgh University in 1834 and was soon recognised as the most distinguished student of his day. He was a genius. He graduated MA in 1841. And he'd already begun the previous year his training in the United Secession Divinity Hall. At the time, the hall had no full-time staff. It was a, a part-time thing that was done during the the long summer vacation of the universities. The principal was John Brown of Edinburgh. John Brown of Broughton Place Church, who of course is known today for his commentaries. I think immediately for his commentary on Hebrews that the Banner of Truth Trust have republished. There was a, a faculty of four, and all of them were pastors. It was very much the sort of model that, that really we, we see the church adopting well, the Evangelical Church is adopting in the last few decades where you have, instead of a full-time staff, you've got 
a part-time course. And today, of course, the, the internet has made things a lot easier. It's much easier now to have a, a part-time theological courses. In the 1840s, it was necessary, even if you were doing a part-time course, to have a, a long period when all the students would congregate at one place, and that would be the church where the principal was the pastor. And so the theological college of the United Secession Church, like a number of the other theological colleges, the the old Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland had the same approach, the, the Relief Church had the same approach. It was a part-time course. Students would be teachers or do something else in the rest of the year, and then they'd come together in the summer, and they would study in these intense sessions. And we see that today in, as a model taken by some theological courses today. And it's a model that needs to be considered in a day and age when most churches are very small. In a day and age when we don't have the sort of resources that the Free Church of Scotland have, the well, like equivalent today to millions of, millions of pounds that could be poured into a, a building like New College and a, a world-class faculty. Now that can happen today in places like the United States of America, it can happen in South Korea. It's not something really that the British churches are capable of doing at the moment. So it's something that we can say, oh, we, we can learn from the past, we can learn. And when I studied at LTS, as it was then, London Seminary as it is now, it was a similar approach. It was, yes, the principal was full-time, but the rest of the faculty were part-time lecturers. They were men who held pastorates and they would come in for part of the week and lecture and they would go back to their churches. Well, Cairns studied and did very well. And in 1843, he, having finished his course, he went to Germany and he took up a, a holiday pastorate at Hamburg, ministering, of course, preaching to the holiday makers from the English-speaking world, Britain and America. He also, in the winter and spring of that year, winter of 1843, spring of 1844, he studied at the University of Berlin. It was something that students did then. They would, if you were anyone with any sort of ability, you'd go and spend some time in Germany. Gresser Machen did that, and it severely undermined his faith. Cairns seems to have spent more time with orthodox professors. Cairns himself remained decidedly orthodox. When he had finished this, he returned to Scotland, and he was licensed to preach. He finished his exams and was licensed to preach on the 3rd of February, 1845. And that very year, he was called to Golden Square Church in Berwick-upon-Tweed, and on the 6th of August he was ordained. He ministered there for many years. It was his only, the only church that he was pastor of apart from that holiday pastorate in Hamburg. In 1847 a great change came because in that year the United Secession Church and the Relief Church, which was another 18th century dissenting Presbyterian denomination in Scotland. Again, it separated over the issue of moderatism, of people, ha of churches having pastors forced upon them who the members didn't like. And not just person in terms of personality, that does happen, but people who were theologically completely opposed to the membership, non-evangelical ministers being forced on evangelical congregations. And so the Presbytery of Relief was organised. And by 1847, negotiations had completed for the Relief Church and the United Secession to join together, and they became the United Presbyterian Church. In 1858, after over ten years of pastoral work, Cairns was awarded the degree of Doctor of Divinity by Edinburgh University. In 
The following year, Edinburgh University went one better and they offered him the principalship, and he turned them down. It w was a great honour. The university was connected with the Church of Scotland. The university's divinity faculty was one of the theological training centres for the Church of Scotland. And they asked a minister of another church to be the principal. And Ken said no. He was ordained to the, the United Secession, which had become the United Presbyterian Church. He was ordained to Golden Square, and he would stay with that denomination. He would stay with them for the rest of his life. In 1863, talks began between the United Presbyterians and the Free Church of Scotland trying to arrange another union. They failed. The Free Church, the sticking point was the Free Church held to the position that the Church should have some connection with the state. Establishment was the ideal. Not being established was a necessary evil at the time. So, so many in the Free Church felt enough to basically torpedo any possibility of union at that time. And in 1867, the whole thing collapsed. And it was decided, no, we can't arrange a union at this time. We need to wait and see developments over the next few decades. So it went. In August of that year, there was a change in Cairn's situation. He was appointed Professor of Apologetics in the United Presbyterian Divinity Hall. But he remained Minister at Golden Square. Again, it was that part-time course. In 1872, he was appointed moderator of the United Presbyterian Synod. And later in the same year, he represented, as the moderator of the UPs, the, the United Presbyterian Church, he represented them in the, the first meeting of the Synod of the French Reformed Church. In 1876... He was appointed as full-time professor of theology in the United Presbyterian Divinity Hall. They decided by this point they had enough money, they had enough resources to buy an existing building and turn it into a dedicated theological college and church headquarters. Part of it was the Synod Hall, which would be used for the meetings, the annual meetings of the Synod, as well as other things. And they appointed a full-time staff, and he was one of them. In spring of 1877, he was invited to come down to London to speak to Jewish people as part of a mission to give lectures on the claims of Christianity, the truth of Christianity, for Jews. So, as to, to evangelise. Again, there's the apologetics position the apologetics element coming out, because he remained Professor of Apologetics as well as Systematic Theology. In April he was sent a letter to tell him that, or well, to invite him to give the Cunningham Lectures in 1880, and he accepted. In the autumn of that same year, he travelled to Norway as part of a delegate trying to prevent a schism, a split, in the Lutheran Church of Norway. In, on the 8th of May 1879, he succeeded Principal Harper as the principal of the United Presbyterian College. He became Principal Cairns, as he was known for the rest of his life, and he would remain in post until almost the end of his life. The Cunningham Lectures followed in 1880. And he continued his work teaching and preaching, and lecturing and travelling, until illness forced him to resign in February of 1892. He died on the 12th of March, which tells you, you know, here's a man who, I have to, re to retire due to illness in February, and he dies in March. Well, I suspect that most people would have retired before then, in terms of the illness that he suffered.
He was dedicated to the work. He literally continued it until almost his dying day. You might say he was married to the job because he was never married to anybody else. He lived a quiet life, and yet he was a noted professor, lecturer, a very gifted man indeed. His uh, Cunningham Lectures are entitled Unbelief in the 18th Century as Contrasted with its Earlier and Later History. Now we have today the New Atheism. Well, they had a new atheism in the 19th century as well, and Cairns, the brilliant man that he was, was dedicated to explaining the connection between the unbelief of the 18th century and the new unbelief of the 19th, but also the, the relationship between these different movements and groups. He explains as he opens the book, I have chosen as the main theme of discussion the unbelief of the 18th century because this period marks in some sense the culmination of unbelief in the history of Christianity. For it was then more widely diffused and with less vigorous resistance than before or since. It was more radical in its antagonism at least than in any former century. Well, of course, things have moved on, haven't they? Unbelief is now much more widely diffused than it was in the 18th century. And its antagonism is far more radical today. The new atheism of Dawkins, the new atheism of Sam Harris, and so on. The militant atheism of the latter part of the 20th century, and particularly the early 21st century, makes 18th century unbelief pale in comparison. But that's why, in many ways, this book is so interesting today for the modern reader. Because we find ourselves in a, a situation that is very similar to ours. Now, because he's a, a historian, because he's doing history, what he does is he goes through the unbelief of the first four centuries in Lecture 1. In Lecture 2, he's talking about unbelief in the 17th century. Yes, he says a little bit about the Middle Ages, but of course in the Middle Ages, if you were an unbeliever, you were liable to get yourself burned at the stake. And even more so in the Reformation era, it's not until the 17th century that it's possible for someone to express unbelief again without being executed, and then not until the latter part of the 17th century, really. He says, when we leave the unbelief of the first Christian centuries, which of course is largely it's pagan philosophizing versus Christianity, but when we leave the unbelief of the first Christian centuries and descend to that period, so that's the period after the Reformation, and we are conscious of a stupendous change in the aspect of the world. The classical paganism is extinct, and only a kind of traditional shot has been fired over its grave by the medieval theology, which is itself ended. A more terrible and disastrous fight has been maintained with a new foe, and against it the Crusades, meaning the Saracen and Turkish invasions of Muslim zeal, have been the chief, if not the only, apologetics of many centuries. But then, having explained how it is, and of course one of the things that leads to a lot of the unbelief in the 17th century is the wars of religion. That you've got a situation where you've got Protestant versus Catholic killing each other. And even in, in England, in Britain, you've got Protestant versus Protestant. And this, this leads some people to almost give up on the whole business of religion, and this is where a lot of modern atheism has its, its root. It doesn't understand that, because most of it doesn't understand its own history. But this book helps us to understand that history. But then he comes into the 18th century. First of all, he speaks of English deism. Deism's a, a reaction to the Civil War. We've had this situation in England where Englishmen have been killing one another, and yes, Welshmen as well, but it's particularly Englishmen have been killing one another. England and Scotland at this point still have very, very different cultures. 
but Englishmen have been killing one another in a struggle, part of which is religious. And so zeal about revealed religion comes to be seen by some people as very, very suspect. But at the same time, most people don't want to be atheists. Certainly in the 18th century, if you were an atheist, you were liable to get yourself killed. And so what arises instead is the idea of rational religion. Deism. And deism, of course, is the idea there is a god. He is the creator. He made everything. And then he left it. He's the clockmaker who builds the clock, winds it up, sets it going and goes off to have his lunch. Or something like that. It is impossible, he says here, to go into an inquiry as to the causes of English deism. The great cause, as always, was the decay of English religion itself, of the Christian religion itself. The fervent interest in spiritual things which had marked the middle period of the 17th century and made it with all its faults the greatest hitherto in English history had, through manifold failing defeat, been followed by the reaction of the Restoration and the visible and notorious denial of Christianity in life and practice prepared the way for its denial in opinion and theory. But one of the things is that there is, and Cairns doesn't really go into it, but we should, that there is this issue about a fear of fanaticism. The, the phrase that's used, the word that's used, is uh, enthusiasm. And so rather than fanaticism, we need rationality. We need to be logical and reasonable. And so human reason becomes the, the plummet by which we judge religion. And so he speaks of English deism. He goes on then to speak of unbelief in France. At the head of the deists, or rather as uniting in himself the deist and the sceptic, is Voltaire. In these limits, only the briefest notice of his long and various life is to be expected, and exclusively in relation to this subject. Already more than a third part of his life, which extended from 1694 to 1778, had passed, when in 1726, being there in his 32nd year, he came as an involuntary exile to England. And so England, we find, contributes to Voltaire and his scepticism and deism. Because one thing that is very interesting about the 18th century unbelief is most of them are not atheists. Most of them are deists. Most of them are people who say, I believe in God, I just don't believe in the God of the Bible. Or I, don't, I, I believe in the God of the Bible, I just don't believe that the Bible is an accurate depiction of him, so they would say. He speaks of unbelief in Germany, the rationalism of Germany. And of course, he had studied in Germany, he'd ministered in Germany, he'd travelled in Germany, he knew German, and he knew Germany. And so he could speak of the influence of unbelief in Germany. And so having dealt with unbelief in the 18th century, he goes on in Lecture 6 to speak of unbelief in the 19th century. He says, I, I, there are, I think, in all, two tendencies in the 19th century which mark unbelief as contrasted with the 18th. The first is a tendency to give the anti-supernatural deeper, more thorough and more radical character. And secondly, it is a tendency, in harmony with this negation, to strive more earnestly to account for Christianity as a phenomenon, and if possible, the favourable rather than unfavourable estimate of its claims. One is left thinking what would Cairns have made of the unbelief of the 20th century and the 21st, when instead of that attempt to give a, a favourable account of Christianity, the great emphasis has been to, to rubbish it, to negate it, to attack it. It's a very thoughtful book, and one is very glad that when they were when the committee were looking for a man to give the Cunningham Lectures in 1880, they chose Principal Cairns. Well, thank you for watching. May God bless you and help you in the reading of the best books, and the best book of all, even the Bible.